Welcome back to the Zuch and Wild podcast. I'm I'm feeling good. We got a little Thursday night recording this week. I got Thursday night football going on. Zuch just said Jared Goff limped off the field. How did he look? Was it like a big ankle, bad bad ankle? Well, it was like it was third and ten, and they're up seventeen with like three minutes left. And for some reason, he dropped back to pass instead of just handing them like four guys landed on top of him. Well, he looked like he should be okay, but. <laughs> It was one of those that you're like, why Why are you doing this right now? Oh, Same thing with Jordan good. Love. He just keeps getting hit, and I don't <laughs> understand why they're doing that. Well, as Dan Campbell would say, I'm going to kick your ass. I don't, I don't care if you got one foot. I'm going to kick your ass. Um, but, yeah, this weekend in college football, there was a lot of butt kicking. Um, I, I felt like this weekend, there was a lot of butt kicking, but a lot of great games. This weekend lived up to the hype. I think rarely do you get a weekend that kind of lives up to the hype that this weekend lived up to. Yeah, really the only game that wasn't, <clears throat> I shouldn't say in doubt. Obviously the Colorado-Oregon game was really never in doubt, but UCLA-USC was close. The Ole Miss game was, I mean, it was a 14-point win for Alabama, but it was pretty, not down to the wire, but like, it, you know, you were watching it till the very end because you're like, oh, they're only up soft and a touchdown away for making a one-score game. Uh, Clemson FSC was really good. Yeah. Notre Dame, Ohio State was oh. ex- an excellent game, but and now we have a, I knew how that would turn out. <laughs> we have a new Stone Cold versus the Rock rivalry brewing in Lou Holtz, Ryan Day, but we're going to get into all of that. We're going to touch on the games and the great storylines going into this week because while the games last week were 10 out of 10, we still got some A-plus games this weekend. So let's recap some of the games last weekend. It was That was awesome. Well, we're going to start off with Zooch. We're going to start with Ryan Day just <laughs> – out of nowhere being completely pissed <laughs> yes. off that Lou Holtz, who, which I like, I didn't even realize Lou Holtz said anything. And usually, I mean, I like Lou Holtz and usually I will watch a little bit of a Pat McAfee mm. show. And like, it's not like Lou Ty, Holtz. Ty like, Schmidt does a Lou, great job at that impression. Ty Schmidt. Well, that's what I was about to is, say. It's like, he does Lou a great Holtz job with like, that impression. Yeah. Lou Holtz is self-aware. Like he went on the show with the guy who impersonates him because he like yeah. thinks it's funny. Like, I mean, and that's I, what, I also think I didn't get about Ryan day is like, you are literally taking like a nine year old man who is like a Notre Dame Homer. Like I love Lou Holtz, but he is a Notre. I mean, he won his national titles there. Like basically became like what everyone knows him. He was always a pretty good coach. Like he was good at Arkansas, get it uh, Minnesota. He was at a few different places, but all he like he really just said what was true too that Ohio State recently knock away that Georgia game last year has gotten bullied by their arch, like the past couple of years the same thing people were saying about Michigan for years with Ohio mm-hmm. State it's like oh you look good but you always lose Ohio State I'm sorry Ohio State you've lost by three scores the last two years to your arch rival so I will also say so Ohio State beat Notre Dame. It was the prediction I got wrong because stupid Marcus Freeman, you know, obviously there's a lot of stuff that went on, but just some bad. I honestly, I, I think for Notre Dame, if there's a couple coaching non errors, you know, or they're throwing the ball on that second down with like, what was it three or four minutes left in the game? They have that missing player. I mean, everyone's heard about the only 10 players on the field, but I don't know. I, I think Notre Dame played well. And I think where I was wrong is that Kyle McCord looked pretty good. I mean, he didn't look great. Yeah. He didn't look like a Heisman contender, but he looked like a player that I think next year could be a Heisman contender. And Ohio State's yeah. defense looks humming. And what I'll say about the Ryan Day, Lou Holtz thing, I think these are just, if there was a, if there was a title for like the YouTube video that is the Ryan Day, Lou Holtz beef, it would be two idiots arguing. Because that's what this is. You have the meatball marinara sandwich himself, Ryan Day, who just looks like he just sweats nonstop and dyes his beard with, uh, like Zuch said, should probably start using that touch for gay, touch of gray, Ryan, because you know you're not looking any younger. And then you have just a babbling buffoon, Luke Lou Holtz, who probably is 20 years past his prime of knowing any football knowledge. So I totally. On one side, I'm on Lou Holtz's side. It's like, you're really going after a 90-year-old Ryan Day. But then on the other side, I'm kind of looking at Ryan Day. It's like, you know what? If you want to fire up your fan base and fire up your team, 
heck yeah, your team's getting called soft. Your team's like all the fair things that you said, Zooch, where you've kind of got beat up by these big boys. And to go out and beat Notre Dame, however ugly it may be, it makes you feel good. It should be a statement victory for this Ohio State program. Yeah, and I – see, what my thing with Marcus Freeman was I didn't hate the trying to throw it when they ha- when it was like two or three minutes left in the game because I hate more when – I would have hated more if they just ran the ball three straight times and just yeah. given them the ball back. The parts that annoyed me were the – and it's like a little – like small things throughout the game. They're like, oh, that, you know, isn't that big of a deal. Like, for example, like that first drive, Notre Dame is going right down the field and Sam Hartman doesn't reach the ball out to make sure he gets the first down. And then the 10 players, it is like I didn't really players. understand the whole, we didn't want to get a penalty because they're, they were on like inside the one yard line. They're not going to move up anymore. So it's like, I would rather just, risk taking the penalty to make sure you're set up than being not set up with three seconds left in the game right. and then moving up like half an inch. Cause it, you know, they just looked at the play and were like, okay, well there's nobody on the left side of the field. We're like right, we're right, just gonna run it. And he work. still barely got in. So if you would have had, I mean, they might've called something differently if, you know, a guy had been on the left side. Did you also but... see the, the, the clip of the, um, uh, what was it? it this I I might have gotten too into Notre Dame Twitter after the loss, where like kind of all the fans are looking for anything to cope. But did you see the uh, Ohio State tight end on that last play? Like flinch, maybe like an inch, like his butt lifts it. a little bit. I don't know if, if you could. If, it, it might have been from I don't know Rudy Lover to some absolute Notre Dame homer. But I mean the the clip I saw, I don't know if it was misstrewed. I don't know if it was bad angle. But it looks like he moves a little bit. Um, this is a game I think that I mean ending this it's a game that I think neither of these teams should feel super down about like I think Notre Dame played hard there's things that you got to improve Ohio State you played hard there's obviously things you got to improve I do think Notre Dame's chance while small they still have a very very small chance of still making the playoffs if you went out so you shouldn't feel bad about Ohio State losing to them and Ohio State the the path is pretty much set for you now if you went out and win the Big Ten you're in well, the good thing, too, for Notre Dame is, I mean, obviously you can't lose again, and they still have, you know, Clemson doesn't look as strong, so that takes away from, you know, I hate saying a team doesn't have a tough schedule, because I still think Notre Dame's schedule is tough, and when they made the schedule, it was supposed to be, you know, Ohio State, USC, Clemson, mm-hmm. all teams that were looking really good. Clemson doesn't look nearly as good, but they still have USC on there, <clears throat> and if you're looking around, a lot of these teams are going to start piling up losses because LSU and Alabama already have one loss. One of the, They play each other again, so you, that's a second loss for one of those teams. Michigan plays Ohio State. Not that, you know, Ohio State would – if Ohio State's only losses to Michigan, they're still going to get in over Notre Dame. They won the game, so they should get in. But it's still – I mean, we're not even out of September yet. And there's still a lot of stuff to be played out. I don't know. I haven't looked at the top 25. I don't know how far they dropped down, but I still think they have a fairly the decent shot. If they, the top 20. Yeah, they have a fairly decent shot. If they went out, they're going to be, I would, I would almost guarantee they're in the top seven if they went oh, out. Cause that would mean 100%. And you I mean, beat a rank Duke, you beat USC. Exactly. That's I mean, I was gonna bring USC up could that Duke have game a couple is now losses, looking, but that Duke game now. I mean, I'm, this is going to end my opinions on this game, but that Duke game now, which we'll touch on later, is now looking like maybe a game that was supposed to be an unranked game when you made the schedule, but now can kind of be like that bounce back, extra ranked win. Get get your mind right game for Notre Dame, but yeah, my opinions on the game. What's the next game? Do we got the Clem Sun? Yes, epic fail, Clemson. You know the best part about this game was was that it was just the perfect encapsulation of Dabo Sweeney when the kicker, who he called up, who had a finance job in New York, and he said, son, we're going to need you to kick for me again. We're going to need you to kick. Instead of just going out to the transfer portal and doing what every other coach in America would have done, he calls up his old kicker, and that's, of course that's the kicker that missed the kick. I mean – I didn't want to have nightmare scenario when they yeah. lost to Duke. I think they are one more loss away, Clemson, from it being banana lands down there. Like they are one more loss. Like I don't know, 
lapse in judgment yeah, to like I mean, an NC State or a Miami, and they're pfft, like they are going to go full panic, um, full panic mode, full full panic mode if they lose one more this year. Yeah, and it's like that weird thing where they've had so much success that it's it's weird. It's almost like a, a teeter totter, I guess. Like mm -hmm. they've had so much success that obviously people want that to continue. And it's not even like they've been, you know, they're not going seven and five or anything like that. They're still in no, New Year's six games. They're still contending for the ACC. Like, but when you're, when you go on a span of like basically being in the playoff or in the national title every year for, five years, whatever that run they yeah. have just been on was. Then, you know, when you have two losses before September is even over, it like they're not used to like – No, and especially – A when, lot of their fans yeah. aren't used to that. Like, No, especially when you've built like – this is like the double-edged sword, the downside of Dabo – when you get someone like Dabo, he's a good coach, but everything or a lot is about him. And when you build your entire identity around like him, almost like this Clemson idol, it's kind of like, well, what happens when like everything that we've built around like it's not it's not working anymore? Like your entire your entire per personality and like world gets shattered, realizing like we can't do this Clemson way anymore and be successful the way we are used to being successful. Right, and um, he's not, you know, I mean, as tough as, as it is for people to hear, you know, they always think these coaches are untouchable, like they've won so much that you, you can't do anything with them. No I one's mean, untouched. I mean, th there's no. probably like two or three people that are untouchable right now. It's Saban, Kirby Smart, and honestly, that might be it. Yeah, and it's one of those things where – like you, like look at Bobby Bowden for example. I saw a thing the other day from like 1986 or something. The 2000, the year 2000, they finished in the top five every year. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there had been a fourteen play, I, I was like, and I went through and looked at like their record and where they were. If there had been a fourteen playoff back then, he they would have been, been in. It. They would have been in the playoff every, every other year, literally that entire time. And at the end, you know. He was almost, and I think that's part part of what is going on with Dabo Sweeney is I think he's almost loyal to a fault. Mm -hmm. It's like it's, Bobby it's, Bowden kept some guys around that probably he should have gotten rid of, and I mean, if Florida State will get rid of Bobby Bowden, you know, they were a legitimately an all women's school, yeah, basically, and no one cared about them until he came around, and they were a powerhouse for almost twenty years, a legitimate. You know, I mean, it's not better than yeah. like the Saban run it. Alabama because he has a ton of national titles yeah. but it was in that time it was equivalent because you didn't have a national title game or a 14 yeah. playoff to where you could lose and still have a chance to you know win the national title so he's not I'm not saying they're gonna fire him if he loses like four no. games this year but I don't think you can I mean yeah I, I I don't think you can but it's definitely panic mode and now that you're on Florida State on the flip side of this game I mean I don't think there's much to say like Jordan, Jordan Travis played Pretty good. I mean, if, if, if you're Florida State, yes, like, they are still in well position to make the playoff. Like, went out and win the ACC, guarantee in, um, especially with some of the teams in your schedule. And if you're Florida State, first of all, I just want to give a shout-out to whoever that linebacker was that killed Cade Club Nick. Totally changed the game <laughs> with that strip fumble for a touchdown. And if you're Florida State, you – it, these are the games that you're winning that you haven't won in the last couple of years. Like, these close games yeah. – that like, you know, they and, have I mean, the they showed now, a lot. And they have the coaching now, and even though you know you you didn't play the best, this is a game where it's like hang your hat on it, feel good down in Tallahassee. Yeah, and it's like like you said, it's usually a Florida State in the past <clears throat> since Jimbo Fisher left, basically. I'd say even his last year there, if they had been down seventeen to zero to Clemson, now it'd have been up two or three score loss. Mm -hmm. And they, they were down what, 14 at three or I, they were, yeah, I know they, they were, were down, down double digits they were down at 10 one points. point. They were down 10 points. And they fought back in it and won the game, which is, I think shows that they are, I mean, I don't know that they were going to win the national title, but they're definitely better than what they have been in the past. And oh, it took, uh, Jay, not yeah, no, Mike Norvell, Jay Mike Norvell's Norvell. brother. 
uh, a little bit of time to get it going. But, you know, Florida State's one of those schools that, you know, you like get going. USC, yeah, USC is one of them. There's a lot of schools like that that, you know, they might be Sleeping down for giants. a while, but Sleeping they're not, giants. yeah, they're not going to stay bad. For, they have, there's too much talent around the, like, in the areas they recruit and they're too big of a brand name that they might, you know, one out of every, every five coaches they might hit on, but the one they hit on makes them, yeah, a force. So, definitely. Yeah, I didn't see a ton of that game. I, I was, busy during that time but i was like looking at my phone i was like oh they're down like maybe they're the same old florida state team so i was pleasantly surprised to see them come back uh well much like this next team we're going to talk about uh we had some difficulties had some technical technical difficulties so i'm in a different room uh with a different computer now it's a little darker for those watching on youtube that's why it just suddenly changed um a sudden change might be a good um Attitude change, or a sudden change of attitude, might be needed for Ole Miss, um, because Zooch they they stunk. They Jackson Dart did exactly what I knew he was going to do, and you were blinded with your homerism of Dart <laughs> for Heisman. You were blinded, and I knew he was Jackson Fart. This game, he would have been Jackson Fart. I mean, you want to just vent? Should, should, I, should I just give you like three minutes to vent here? It's not even like I'm not even mad at him because I just think that he. I mean, there's only so much you can do. I think when people are just breathing down, like he took so. I sent that video as like a joke in the group chat, but like that's literally what it was like. Like his helmet was off every other play, and he just like look at it. And you're like, you know, at what like at what point are these some of these coaches who know they're an underdog gonna start doing stuff? You know, I guess they all think that, like, they want to go in and prove that they're just as talented or whatever the reason Ole Miss, is they Ole don't. Miss's offense is not built to build beat Alabama. I was, I was, I don't know whose podcast I was listening to, but I, I totally agreed with that. Like, that offense is built to, like you said, Ole Miss has been doing, win eight or nine games a year, maybe get to the Sugar Bowl or Citrus Bowl. It's not built to beat a team like Alabama. No, and they've got to get, you know, I don't fully understand why instead of using because they have a good and I, like they have everything you could want realistically they have the head coach they wanted they have a a decent at least quarterback they have a good running back they have playmakers but for some reason they went out and gave spencer saunders all this nil money and didn't mm-hmm. use the transfer like link heaven's great in the transfer portal but their offensive line, I mean, there's no reason Quinshawn Juggins yeah, should yeah, but where's he not been? Be... I'd like to file a missing persons <clears throat> report. Where get, is where he, where he has he been? He's the line of scrimmage every time he takes a handoff. And that's part of the reason, you know, they can't open up play action. And you can just basically pin your ears back if you're Alabama or whoever it is and know, all right, well, they can't run the ball on us because these guys can't block. So let's just full rush everybody and we'll get to the quarterback because he has no time to throw you know the only thing that really he did that I wasn't thrilled with was that long interception he threw in a like Mm -hmm. triple I don't know what I think that was like a almost like a thought process of we need something big here because it's not like we can't like sustain drives I guess Mm -hmm. but at that point you know you were only down a little bit like you didn't really need to do that there but I somewhat understand that that mindset of we have to have a big play here even though you didn't but yeah it was just that you know i mean this is it's, it's lane kiffin i mean like you said what's what's a big game he's won he yeah, hasn't, i mean he hasn't won one yet yeah he had you know that first year but even that first year like lsu was down you know he i mean and he still got chances this year they still have they have lsu yeah. this week we'll they talk have, about that later yeah Georgia later on in the year so they still you know have a chance and I think that you know maybe they're still a little bit away but I do I I do believe that he's gonna make them like a quasi contender I'm not saying they're gonna be Alabama or Georgia but I do think he can I think the 12 team playoff helps a team a a lot like Ole Miss like yeah I think you know helps Ole Miss a ton well and it's like they're like one of those weird I don't know how to describe it because they're one of those odd schools that puts in a lot of NFL talent. Like, 
Mm-hmm. They had DK Metcalf. They had uh, AJ Brown. AJ Brown. They had uh, Patrick Willis went to Ole Miss. They they have had really really good guys make it to the NFL, but it's just almost one of those things that. And they'll win, like I guarantee they're you, they'll tough, win one. They're in a tough division. I mean, yeah, they're and it's you know week in and week out. You know, Alabama and LSU back to back is not, you know, and it like looks bad. Like if they lose it, and then you're three and two, you know, a lot of teams would be really happy probably to be three and two. But when you're three and two and zero oh and two in the SEC, mm. you're not winning the division. You're not going to go to the SEC championship. So, but you know, you win this one and. You still look around and you're like, okay, you know, Alabama still has X A and M. Alabama still has LSU. Uh, LSU still has a like all, a lot of teams still play each other. So you have to win this one, but it's not you know the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. Not at all. Uh, so we'll see what they do. I mean, they have to win. They have a game at home this week. So if they lose that one, though, I think that. People are going to be a little tired of the like being funny, and like I like Lane Kiffin's personality, but people yeah. are going to get a little tired of like the like banter with you know Nick Saban. People are going to get tired. Well, I mean, we'll get into it later. But how could you ever get how could you ever get mad at hashtag Come to the Sip? I've been I've been yeah. doing I've, I've I've been repping hashtag Come to the Sip. Yeah, for no, he's three done. years now. He's done, and like, and you know, he has gotten a lot of the stuff he wanted there too. You know. He's gotten more pay for his assistant coaches. He got a better NIL thing set up. He's got he's gotten a lot of the stuff he's asked for. Mm-hmm. So now it's his turn to reciprocate what they have given him because they'll like they've always had like their games. People are always at their games. They have the one of if not the best tailgating scenes in mm-hmm. the country. You know, people will go regardless of like what their record is that's just how you know Mm -hmm. there's not i don't think you've ever been to oxford but there's not a ton of stuff to do around oxford like you can go to memphis which is an hour and a half but it's not like memphis is the safest city in america to like no it's not go hang out at it's also not in the midwest (laughs) i will say that (laughs) not in the midwest i mean it just Quitting, quickly touching on Alabama. Why do we ever freak out about Saban? Like I, Saban, last, like why? Why does anyone? Why do we? Why does anyone in the media? Why does any players and coaches? Saban's gonna write the ship, and like we talked about, you know, maybe this is not a playoff team this year, but they'll still probably be in the Sugar Bowl or Peach Bowl. Like, it, yeah, I mean, exactly. as simple as it is, I'm gonna leave it at that for me. Like, they're still probably gonna be in the Sugar Bowl or Peach Bowl. Right, and it's because he does like. As much as people like want to get on him about freaking out on a third string guy when they're up seventy five to three in the fourth quarter, the reason he does that is because like it's very like when Alabama loses normally, it's because of men like the only game I can kind of think of recently that they or I guess a couple they got beat pretty bad by Clemson that one national title a few years mm-hmm. ago, and then Joe Burrow LSU and yeah they were dominant. They got beat pretty handily in that one, I believe. I maybe that one was closer than I'm thinking it was. It was but usually, it was pretty close, but LSU pulled away. Yeah, but usually, like when Nick, when he loses there, it's his teams make like little mental errors that you know mm-hmm. Alabama still could have won the game, and that's you know the other day it was Ole Miss making the mental errors, like you know Alabama had the one the. Definitely. interception in the end zone but they came out at halftime and did what they know would work and they I mean the Ole Miss defense really played great for how much they were on the field like allowing 24 points Alabama you think you probably have a pretty good shot of winning but you have to you know be able to do more than score on like your you first do. or second drive of the game yeah. so I mean the SEC the SEC West is a gauntlet. The SEC West is a gauntlet. But what do we got next in our rundown gauntlet? Your boy Cam Ward. Yes. Boom. Finally got to it. And I was right again. Because if you guys saw at the beginning of the video, I still think I have it. Cam Ward for Heisman. And guess what? We're going to start the Cam. Uh, it's going to be the NWO. New Ward <laughs> Order for life. 
for life. You should actually life. get with them. They should start. They would make a ton of. Oh yeah, money no, on you can take shirt. that for free. Just let us actually d don't take it for free. Just give me like a couple per percent or cents off each sale. Yes, Cam Ward, the NWO New Ward Order for Life. Cam Ward Heisman campaign starts now. He looks so good against a good Oregon State team. I, mean, I don't want to get this twisted. Oregon State is good. It's a top twenty-five team, and he with. In, I'm 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 gonna say it. Inferior talent. The rest of his team compared to Oregon State, he went out there and got Wazoo the win. And Wazoo right now is thinking, hmm, we're probably one upset away, two upsets away for playing in the New Year Six. Yeah. Now he is third in the offensive leaders for uh, oh life quarterbacks. Oh, life. He's, only, he's really only uh, twenty yards behind Shador Sanders and then Michael Penix is like 300 yards ahead of everybody basically but i mean yeah he's and that's like he's in that weird element right now where i don't and it was like kind of weird for him last week too because i think most people are watching you know the old miss game or different games around the nation and that he's getting effect like he if he was on you know Washington or Oregon, like I mean, you see Bo Nix and Michael Penix. They he's, get... he's totally getting overlooked. I think in another Pac-12 year where there's not as many good, let's just say it's only okay. Let's let's just say COVID doesn't exist, so it's only Caleb Williams and Shooter Sanders who are the premium quarterbacks in the Pac-12. I think he's getting national attention. It's just the Pac-12 is so quarterback saturated, but they'll learn. I'm going to use the Dion turn. We come in us warders is what I'm going to call the Ward fan bakes. Actually, no, it is the NWO, the new Ward order for life. We're coming. Well, and, and the, new ward, the new Ward order is coming. Another thing, because I am pretty sure he's a transfer guy too, right? Yes, he came from, can you guess it? Uh, not Incarnate off the top of my world. head, no. Incarnate World University. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I really am starting to wonder, because if you look at, the quarterbacks who are really, really good this year, every single one of them is a transfer. Like if you oh, yeah. pick, if you looked at, Ex yeah, five. If like you took today, like your top five Heisman leaders, right? You'd have Caleb Williams, probably Bo Nix, uh, Sanders, Michael Penix, Michael Penix, Shador Sanders, Quinn Ewers. Every single one of those guys. Yeah. So, and he, every single one of those guys is a transfer guy. It's very, and I don't like, it's weird because all like, I don't even know though, because Caleb Williams is really the only one who was like a starter at another school. Bo Nix, he, Bo Nix started and, oh, Bo Nix, and yeah, Pennick so started and, and Pennick started and Cam Ward started NWO for life. New Ward order. Okay. I'm going to keep saying so it to all... drill it into you people's heads because he's coming. Cam Ward's coming. So they all started, but it's – there's none of these guys – none of the – I can't think of like a single junior or senior that is on a title contender who is really, really stuck good. around. Like, yeah, and it's – stuck around. Um, Off the top of my head, maybe Tyler Van Dyke at Miami. That's about it. Yeah, so – I'm I'm really starting to wonder. Drake like, May, I, maybe. Yeah, Drake May's up there, but there's not a ton. Like the transfer portal, it's almost starting to like become a fact that you have to. You have to go I mean, into that seen, to get you know. You've seen the, the, all the good teams. They they got these players now, and then like quarterbacks too. You can find them at Incarnate World University. But yeah, yeah. Cam Ward, NWO, New World Order. So you ready? You, are you, are you going to do it with me? Or are you going to join the for, NWO for life? Yes, sir. For life. <laughs> All right. So what's the next game we got? So I think um, there weren't a ton of – I'm trying to think of who else played. We went oh, over the Notre oh, Dame game. We're, we are going to end it with the big one that we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it because too many people and too many podcasts have talked about it, and that's Oregon, Colorado. Yeah, that one was just, you know – they got. They got they got blown out. I mean, I don't want to talk about something that's already been talked about so much. I guess my two cents is the Colorado hype train. I think is going to die. So it's going to start to die down. And Oregon, it's so funny hearing Oregon calling another university a clicks like university. When oh, I remember, like 
every middle schooler wanted like your Nike elite sock combo. So either way, Oregon's very good though. Like that, 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 that Washington matchup in a few weeks is going to be prime time. Right. And it's, it's funny because we're in that stage now where and make no mistake. Deion Sanders is a cocky guy. He, I mean, he always, he, the man backs doused. it up though. He backs it up. Yeah. He backs it up. Except for and, this game. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, and if he does get right the ship there, which I mean, it's, I think most signs are pointing to he is going to make them a pretty good program. Granted, they won't be playing Oregon because of all this realignment crap. But he strikes me as the type of guy who will kind of keep that stuff in the back of his head. Like, he'll remember oh. that. And if they were he ever had, to play a, Oregon again. He had the great quote. He, he, he had the great quote. Get us now because this is the worst we're ever going to be. Get us now because this is the worst we're ever going to be. I mean, and it's yeah, like he, we both – it's like we both said, it's because of the line play. I mean, it's just because of that line play. Right. They just couldn't, you know, block. And, you know, that was probably coming. I don't think most people thought Colorado was going to go unbeaten. or. But he, I mean, you know, people are uh, throwing out the thing of Shiloh Sanders, like, talking trash before. Like, yeah. that's what, that's not, like, that's nothing new. That's what got, like, that's what, it's a, competition and like with guys who are pretty confident in their mm. abilities like it's a, yeah i don't even think he really thought everything he was saying it was like a mind game like oh i'm gonna talk to him and we're gonna and stomp on colorado, the O. and that's what colorado does to get themselves hyped but it's also yeah. it also if you're oregon heck yeah take, take it personal i don't blame oregon at all for taking it personal oh like no. you can't and they want you can't and, and I think Dion handles it perfectly because he's like, yeah, this is what we're going to do. But if you come out and you kick our butt, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to accept that we, we got our butt kicked. So, yeah, that's our that's my two cents on that game. You got anything else on that game? Not really. And I think that pretty much wraps up last oh, week. Oh, we, like was... we, have, um, uh, we have Iowa and West Coast Iowa. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah Iowa. UCLA and Iowa, they, they both stink. Utah and Penn State, both dark horses. Uh, sorry uh ucla and iowa you guys stink so much we're not gonna completely talk about your game all right so let's get in we can that was a lot of fun let's get into the games this week though that was some great games last week though we start off tomorrow night with oregon state and utah i think this is going to be the friday night game of the year i don't think i mean minus the black friday games i don't think there's going to be a friday game that's this good you got two ranked teams we still don't know if cam rising's playing Oregon State, like like I said, they are a good team. This is a top twenty-five team. In Utah's a team, like they're weak. Like Utah just wins ugly. They won ugly again. That defense is legit with NFL players, but the offense just kind of looks like it's stuck in the sixties. Is that the right word? Like they just yeah. they don't think they can sustain drives. And I think Oregon is a team unlike UCLA who seems to always get rattled. Oregon State, I feel like, is built like a team who doesn't get rattled. Right, and this kind of strikes me as one of those games where you, like, Utah might give up, like, 24 to 27 points, but half or more of those points are because their offense, offense yes. makes bad plays and puts the defense in a position where, or because it's in uh, Corvallis, right? I'm pretty. I'm yes. almost positive yes. it's in Corvallis. So. They got the all oranges coming out this week. All orange uniforms. It's gonna be sweet. But that'll be sick. Yeah. So it almost strikes me as one of those that you know, Oregon State's gonna be up like seventeen to zero at one point, but it's gonna be because almost kind of like that uh, Cal uh, Washington game the other night where Michael Penix hadn't even taken the field yet and it was fourteen to zero. Well, that's Cal I mean, for like, you. So yeah, and like obviously I think Utah is better than Cal, but. Utah always seems to have those games where, you know, they'll come out and, like, they could come out and beat Washington and just, like, shut the, that offense down, basically, and win 31-20 to 20 or something like that. But then they have, like, a game, like, I'm thinking this game is going to go, where they, you know, get inside the Oregon State 30 and fumble it twice and mm-hmm. there's a pick six or a kind of like how that utah versus oregon game went the mariota year where you caught utah just couldn't seem to get out of their own head yeah so it's like i don't know i'm excited for that game because it's oh, I'm, I'm stoked it's like an under the radar game and it shouldn't be because it's like it's like you teams. said two, 
two ranked teams. You know, Utah still on Utah wins that game. They're five and zero. Oregon State wins that game. They're Four right one. back in the yeah Pac twelve title hunt. So that's probably the game. Um, I don't know about looking most forward to, but it's up there on like not having a rooting interest. It's the game I'm looking most Definitely. forward to. I should say. Yeah, it's going to be a very very good game. But I think this next game we got. This next game we got. This this is my most exciting game because just for the storyline, if Duke beats Notre Dame, Duke is immediately thrust into the playoff conversation, which is a phrase I'd never thought I'd ever utter. But if Duke wins this, they'd have a win versus Clemson. They'd have a win versus Notre Dame if they win. And they have a whole ACC slate to play. Well, I don't know who's on your schedule, but you're going to run into probably a Miami or a Florida State at some point. And you're looking, if you run the table in the ACC, you're going to win because you're going to have to run into Florida State. Like Duke, I have never been more excited for Duke football, I think, in my life. Mike Elko has, has those this team playing so phenomenal. They do. And it's weird. Like <clears throat> It's the first time game day has been to uh, Duke ever. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense because I legitimately don't think I saw Duke football on national television until like four years ago. Like that year I, they randomly made the ACC, the ACC championship. Game. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Like there is a, when I first started watching football, there is a span where you'd be like watching the ticker. And I swear to God, for like five straight years, you would just see <laughs> NC State seven and four, Duke, I went 11. North <laughs> yeah. Carolina, five and five, Duke, I went 10. <laughs> Like I, was, they, I legitimately do not remember them being on television oh, until David Cutcliffe got there, and he did a really good job. Like that's one of those places where, like, you they don't get enough shine, but you like look back and you're like, damn, this guy David Cutcliffe took a team that literally would have one or two wins a year for like I, I'll have to look at it to make sure, but I know got from, like, eligible. Oh, yeah, like I don't. They weren't putting people in the NFL. They were all just horrible, like the depths <laughs> of hell, like a bad team. Like there's no one ever. Well, I, I, I mean, them. I mean, Coward K had to hog too much of the spotlight in the early 2000s, unfortunately. Also, true. if also if Coach K is there at game day, I change all my opinions on Duke, and I hope Notre Dame beats the crap out of them. So, well, yeah. you know, he that's will. Just, that's, 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 oh, loss, automatic loss if, if Coach K is there. Coach that guy K. just can't. That guy. I mean, maybe he's close enough to Clemson, South Carolina. Maybe him and Dabo should have a conference on uh, how to make things about yourself 101. Um, <laughs> and pull a, like, I'll never forget when Coach K had the season where he knew Duke was going to be bad, so he just had back surgery so he didn't have to coach uh, the entire yep. year. <laughs> yep, yep, he's he's the word. Uh, like, he, it, it, mm, we will get into Coach K in the off season, but I'll just say Coach K could have been like the cool grandpa, like he was the cool young guy in the '90s, and he just turned into the cranky grandpa. Um, I will say the one thing I last thing I'll say about this game is that this is probably the worst week to play in Notre Dame because they're going to come in pissed and focused. Yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see because I think they could do that, come in pissed or focused. But part of me thinks that they could be it could be. One of those scenarios where they're energy so, hangover, like, where they're just so spent, they're so spent that they come out and they play bad. Like, I either think that it'll be a really close game to the end, or Notre Dame will be up like 28 to 3 at halftime and it'll never really be in doubt. So, yeah, I'm, but that's why we watch because who knows? That is, but why we do we have watch. an undefeated matchup the Kansas, Kansas Texas. Jayhawks yes. Versus Rock Chalk Jayhawk. What do they the do Texas at Rock Chalk? Longhorns. The Texas Longhorns. So I have a I have a bold prediction for this game. Let's hear it. I think Texas kills them. Do you? Is that is that very bold? I, I think that I think Texas kills them. I don't know. Yeah. They looked it is part of because they have the talent this year and the game last week. That's that's a game that old Texas teams. That's the the Tom Herman Texas teams. Charlie Strong Texas teams. They kind of fart away and maybe like lose that one to Baylor. And Sark, you know, I, I joke so much about Sark because there's so much to joke about. But he had them focused and they got talent and they got Quinn Ewers. 
and it's gonna it breaks my heart to say this about Kansas. And I know Kansas is good and they're gonna be fine in the Big Twelve. It's just a lot of it's based on gut, and I think this is gonna be like a Quinn Ewers going, Hey, I know there's a lot of great quarterbacks in the Pac twelve, but I still exist too. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I haven't watched a ton of either team. Uh, because like for example, the Texas Alabama game, I was at the UCF Boise State game and they were up against each other so you have no service in that football stadium so all you're getting is like hoping to god that game cast loads so you can just see the score <laughs> so i i don't really know like you've probably seen m- more of them than i have i know kansas barely beat nevada the other day who is the worst team and that's also a reason that scared me like and and they and they let byu kind of hang on like they were beating them in all facets and they and they let BYU they're a they're a they're a pesky team this year. Don't yeah. don't BYU's gonna give some people trouble in the Big 12. Like they're I'm not gonna say they're gonna win the Big 12, but BYU's gonna give them trouble. They also got their welcome to the uh power five three seconds into that game when that receiver just got <laughs> out Oh my burned. gosh, we have to talk about that. Yes. That guy got creamed. I don't know. That that guy was probably from what like Spanish Fork, Utah. Just yeah. some kids, BYU fan his whole life. Oh boy, I finally get to play in the a Power Five conference. A uh, boom. What was that? Yeah. That's uh, Kobe Bryant that hit him from uh, Kansas, I think. Was it he? The, I. That is the biggest hit of the year because that dude yeah. literally went straight to the ground. No, yeah, so he got, he got destroyed. Of, oh. The, uh, the, speaking of the slate this week, we talked a little bit about it earlier. The Ole Miss LSU game. I mean, L- LSU looked bad the second half of that FSU game. They've looked pretty good since. I mean, I think it'll be another close one. I just hope that Ole Miss can win I mean, this I think, time around. Like, I think they're this bringing is the in the, of the most like one of the most likable coaches versus the most unlikable coach in the SEC. It is. And they're honoring Eli Manning at the game on Saturday. So good, good move, good move. The Mannings we'll will be there. Yep, uh, good move. Uh, there was something else they were doing. Oh, they have like this world-renowned national anthem singer. So they're putting all their chips into into this game. I like this. I like this play. I like this play for the Land Sharks. We will see. I'll get my hopes up again, like a mor- the moron that I am, and. <laughs> Then be annoyed if it's, you know, 17-7 to at halftime and Jaden Daniels has completed his last 14 passes. Mm -hmm. So I I don't even want to give a prediction on it because I'm putting the prediction days behind me because I just can't. (laughs) With the teams I like, I can't do it anymore. Like I said it earlier today, I don't even expect Boise State to win any of these games against decent to better opponents like yeah, I know. I know they'll beat New Mexico. I know Old Miss will beat Georgia Tech, mm-hmm. but uh, other than that, I'm just like I'm just tempering my expectations because <laughs> then you just end up mad all Saturday night. You don't go to bed till two thirty in the morning because you're like, oh yeah, you get all the things on Twitter where it's like someone you don't <laughs> even know who's <laughs> tweeting about nil funds and or someone needs to go yeah. You get you get the negative Nancy tweeting about NIL phones and how we're gonna lose like our best player. Then you get like Senor Positive, who's going like, "Come on, recruits, read these messages, guys." If you, I'll be honest <laughs> with you, if you are a recruit and you get that upset by, if you get so upset by a fan saying you're not good that it makes you not want to be at the school, I don't want you on my team. I. I have to agree with you. I mean, obviously, there are some stuff that crosses the line with, like, if you go personal attacks. But if you can't handle someone going, hey, you did not play football that well, especially at these big schools, like at the Division One FCS level, I'm going to use a Dan Hawkins quote. It's Division One football. It's the Big right. 12. Go play intramurals, brother. Go play intramurals. Yeah, but exactly. I, I, th- I also think that that is – part of the deal that like fans kind of blow up like i'm sure like if players read the comments and they they they, even the negative ones and they probably just go like oh man that sucks like why does this guy think think about me but it's not like i don't think there's a lot of players going like oh he said something bad about me i'm gonna go like transfer schools now like these guys 
grew up with social media. I mean, I grew up with social media. If I, I don't think these guys are as soft as some fans think they are. Like, no, I don't really think not. people. I mean, if and like you said, if you view at a mean comment and go, "Well, I'm transferring schools now," I don't think I would want you on at my school anyway. Right, and you got to be, you know, be a little bit more self-assured than that you know just be like yeah like you know and that like that i think that's part of what draws people to Deion sanders that they got killed and he still still, like believes in his team like says you know yeah we got killed but we're gonna get better and you know obviously like if that was four years in that message would bring hollow a little bit but Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of college like football teams with the transfer portal and stuff, you end up having to put guys into situations where they're probably playing a little bit sooner than mm-hmm. what they were meant to be. But you didn't go to the school if you didn't like. I don't know anyone who goes to a school and really wants to not start as a freshman. Like the whole idea of it is, I'm getting a scholarship to go play here. Like I want to be really good. I don't, you know, I don't see many guys going to school and being like. Well, I didn't really want to play till my junior year. Like it's you yeah, know, 1994. Like that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> like, most of the time, the, the good recruits now are playing pretty early. Like you go to a school, and you're setting yourself apart. So I think you can deal with someone you don't even. Know. I mean, literally anyone that can have access to the internet. So I know I've never understood why you would get so I think- dramatic about somebody saying something mean about you. I think I think fans think they get mad more than the players actually get mad. I, I like I I don't think players actually get as mad as fans think they are. Um, yeah, I, and there's one more game. It's that we, we got to touch on quickly. Uh, Colorado USC. Um, like I said, this is at the end because every other podcast and every other sports media is covering this. Uh, do you think this breaks the record for like most watched early college football game of all time? I think it honestly might get north of a. This might hit like 15 million viewers at like noon, honestly. Yeah, I th- and I think too it will be a little bit closer than that game was last week. Not because I think that Oregon is like a ton better than USC. I think the and matchups think are just a little bit better. The matchups are a little bit better, and I think that Oregon just kind of like blitzed them at the beginning of the game. Like I don't. I mean, I think Oregon would probably win. 99 times out of 100 based on like rewatching some of the highlights. Yeah. But I don't necessarily know that it would always be 42 to 6 or whatever the final score was. Like, and you know, I don't, I think USC will probably win. I do think that Colorado is going to knock like some of the teams we've talked about tonight. One of the Utah, uh, Washington oh, I State. Think- I think they're going to knock off one of those teams. I'd be very nervous if I was Utah playing Colorado. I'd be yeah, because I, I think Colorado is like a UCLA that might, you know, they, they might not have the talent of up front that, that Utah has, but I think they got, they don't get <laughs> spooked as much as UCLA would. But no, I think this is a good matchup. I, I think Colorado is going to make some better plays. I mean, with the Alex Grinch's defense, we've talked about it before. It's It's night and day what it could be. They could look great. They could look – and this is a USC team yeah. that couldn't put away ASU and kind of let them hang around late in Tempe this week. It was. I was, like, watching – it was weird, which I forgot. I was in Texas over the weekend, and I forgot how nice it is. West Coast sports watching. West Coast and Mountain because, like, that USC game started at, like, 11 o'clock, and, it, you know. No, I couldn't do it. I don't know. Like how, we've, I don't know. My salute goes out to our East Coast listeners, Central Time listeners. You guys, if you guys are staying up to watch Pac-12 after dark, that's 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 real greasy, but awesome. Yeah, and you don't realize, like here, you know, you if you you can almost plan, like if you have a night, like if we're both Boise State alumni, if Boise State plays at seven thirty or eight o'clock at night. You can watch all the games. That game ends, and you can still like go out, like go downtown to go bar hopping, yeah. or whatever it is you want to do. And you don't like realize that <clears throat> if you were to move to the East Coast, like you realize that you're like, damn, that game starts late there. But until you're like actually watching it, like I was watching that game in our hotel room, and I'm like, I ended up going to bed because <laughs> it was you know 
one in the morning and like the third quarter was just starting. And I was like, this is so like, I, I can't <laughs> imagine, like, obviously I would if it it's was, like, it's like the Boise Squidward State, with but... just like his crusty eyes and like his hands like this, the Squidward meme. You just got to put that with you. That's you just have it. Yeah, and it's like, you're just too tired. Yeah. You're too tired. And like, even like the Notre Dame Ohio state game, it felt like it ended so late that you're like, Oh my God. Like it's, you know, it was late, yeah. Like West Coast time or Mountain time, you can watch that five thirty game and almost still go get dinner at ninety nine percent of places <laughs> yeah. after that game ends. Like they are no, like, seriously. Oh, it's eleven o'clock I love, at night. In this game plus, I love. I mean, like the one slight downside is the nine a.m. and like the early games kind of like stink for like in person. But like I love watching nine a.m. games on TV. I said it last week. Yeah. Ice coffee well, and football in the morning is great. Well, even, everyone should like, try it. It's it's, it's awesome. Well, even those like middle games, it's like you can almost like the SEC on CBS game. If it ends up being a blowout, you can take a little power nap and wake up, and it's you know four thirty. You're like, oh, I'm not going to watch the last half of the third quarter and the fourth quarter of this game. I'm going to take a nap. You just fall asleep, whatever it is. But East Coast and Central Time, those games aren't ending until like six thirty. Mm-hmm. So it's like I don't know. It, it, forgot how much I have become accustomed to the mountain time zone and uh, being able to plan a little bit better around like I like you know th- that marquee game that's in the afternoon being at 1 30 way more than I like 3 30 oh. or 2 30 it doesn't it's only Same. you know an hour difference 1 30 and 2 30 but it feels like it's like Something six hours. feels better no I so I, I, guess, I, totally, I mean that's totally pretty much it for 100 agree. Yeah, there, I mean obviously there's a ton of games. Uh, I mean yeah, no, yeah. that's it. I mean those are the, all the games that I want to touch on. I mean there's a couple of ranked people playing non-ranked teams that. So I guess I think now we'll we can move to our meme matchup. Meme match. Yeah, you, I guess I could start it off this week. So like like we said, besides the ranked matchups, there wasn't a ton of like real like meme matchups. But I actually went to the FCS to find a matchup. Zuch, are you ready for this? I'm going to start off this meme matchup. It is the Fighting Aggies of UC Davis versus the Mustangs of Cal Poly in a rivalry game. This is this is going to be an awesome matchup. This is now UC Davis. They've won this game six in a row, all right? All right, this is the battle for the Golden Horseshoe. This is big-time rivalry FCS ball out here in California. Battle of the Golden Horseshoe. This game's, you know, these teams have been playing each other every year since 2004. They played way before that in the 1930s and the 80s. Davis, they've won six games in a row against them. But Cal Poly, guess who they got? Guess who's their ace up their sleeve? Brock Huard's kid, Sam Huard. Brock Huard's kid, Sam Huard. It is going to be... Excellent, Sam Huard. I had no five star. Saying. Oh yeah, he he he's there. He transferred from Washington, but yeah, that's my me matchup. UC Davis versus Cal Poly. Well, mine is, and I'll see how this goes because we're still battling the technical difficulties. I mine is Maryland versus Indiana. And I truly had no idea that Maryland could be 5-0 and after this game. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tua's brother's playing pretty well. Mine is, so mine is Maryland, who could be 5-0. and No clue they were undefeated against Indiana, who is back to being Indiana. And their goofy coach with his spectacles, as I like to call them, <laughs> is probably going to score on like the first drive, and then it'll be 41-7 to at halftime. Because, Mar- I mean, Mar- like... It kind of looks like they're kind of building like a decent program over there. With uh, no, I cannot think of that coach's name that came over from Alabama. But no, I, I know I know who you're thinking you know, of. But uh, the Indiana coach isn't that like Harbaugh's like brother-in-law? I think so. <laughs> or is that the Indiana basketball coach? Am I am I, am I getting that mixed up? Oh um, no, Harbaugh's brother-in-law was Tom Crean. That's who it was. <laughs> yeah. Who used to be <laughs> Tom Crean and the. I've never seen a coach as shocked as he was when they hit that game winner against Kentucky a while back. Where he was just like, hey, I don't think he thought it went in for like 15 seconds. No, no but I, totally... I don't know where Tom Crean is now. But yeah, I mean, there was like there wasn't a ton of 
like there were some good matchups this week, but there was none that, you know, I looked at. Like I almost went with Texas A&M and Arkansas, but that is I just think that's like more the, of the sad that's more of a sad matchup. That's that's yeah, the that's, sad matchup of the week. The sad sad matchup of the week. <laughs> that's how we put a lot of money in these football programs. Please do something <laughs> other than like win the citrus bowl for the love of God. <laughs> I mean, shoot, if you're Texas A&M, you'd take the Citrus Bowl at this point. They might be playing themselves into the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl. They, that is very well. I mean, I guess we'll see how Miami does, which they're another, like, one of those. I mean, obviously, Miami's a great historic program, but mm-hmm. they're, like, kind of doing that undefeated. Like, no one's really talking about Miami, mm-hmm. and they're undefeated. They're like, not. you know, once they, once they get that matchup with Slowly FSU, jumping. I'm sure. Oh, big time. I mean, I'm hey. excited. I, I used, that was one of my favorite games to watch as a kid was Miami versus FSU because you know it would be if, dirty if both, and violent. And I'm telling you, if both those teams are undefeated, though, you know what's coming, and I know what's coming. And this is the last thing about the me matchup. Wide right crew, they'll come <laughs> back. They'll if, if if Florida State and Miami are undefeated, and it comes down to a field goal. I'm just going to start filming with my phone now because I know it's going to be one of the funniest things of all time if Florida State goes wide right again. If I seriously, and I'm being 100% dead on about this, if I had gone to FSU during those wide rights and right left, I would have stopped watching football. <laughs> I legitimately, like, after, like, the third one, I'd have been like, I cannot do this <laughs> anymore. That's not like a, you know... A- a good program and like this team just like beats us 41 to 7 every year that's a you legitimately had like four or five years that you could would have won the national title if a yep. kicker would have just made the field goal and it didn't happen once or twice it got up to like four that's yeah, just like no, it, like the only thing i, can I think they think went wide it, left one year they went wide left one year yeah, it was like four wide rights and then a wide like the only thing I can even think of that comes quite close to that would be like you're in the final four all the time and somebody hits a game like but it's not even like that because it would be somebody doing it to beat you. It's like you're beating it's yourself. Like you you've missed four open mid range jump shots in the final four to send you to the national championship game. Yeah. And like, it's like, like, like four elbow jumpers. Yeah, I oh, could wow. I Truly can't imagine, but now we can move oh, yeah. our, on to our high-low Buffalo. Yeah, uh, let's try to speed run this since the technical difficulties are kicking in. But I think I got some good ones. We're going to do some high-low Buffalo predicted performances for this upcoming week, non-QBs. Last week we did QBs. I was right about a lot of them. This week we're going to be doing non-QBs. So I'm going to start with my high. And my high is going to okay. be Audric Estime, the running back of Notre Dame. I think Notre okay, Dame is going to be the same Duke. high then. Per, this, that, that, that should tell you all. I mean, do you want to talk? I mean, I think he is a running back and a player that's kind of building some momentum. He's, I think he might be the best running back in the country right now. Oh, the Notre Dame offensive line is churning. Um, Duke also gives up like over 100 yards rushing a game. And they haven't really played, I mean, I guess Will Shipley's all right at Clemson, but they haven't really played a big rushing attack. I think Audric has a day this Saturday. Yeah, I, I agree. I think he is kind of, he gets a little bit overshadowed because Sam Hartman came there, but he has been a legitimate workhorse. Like looking at it right now, he leads the nation in rushing. It, he has 600 yards. Granted, they had the week zero game, so he you know, has a basically a game above everybody else. But, I mean, yeah, he kind of just burst onto the scene this year. Like, he was pretty good last year. But, I mean, he's averaging 7.7 yards in attempt right now, which is insane. He should honestly probably be getting the ball more, more? I would say. Uh, but, yeah, I think – it, that Duke Notre Dame game kind of strikes me as one of those that Notre Dame is just gonna kind of waste the clock a little bit, and I don't know, just start, start to get that kind of wear that, Duke that, down, I guess. That lean that Oregon got going against Colorado, where the O line just starts leaning on players, and you just like five yards, ten yards, seven yards, nine yards. So it, it might yeah. be one of those days if if Duke doesn't come out ready to play, but. 
my low is it's actually a surprising low because I don't think this player is bad at all. I just think he's going to have a down week. That's Trevor Etienne running back out of Florida. And it's not so much his performances as of lately because he's going to play himself into a very early NFL draft pick next year, in my opinion. But they're going up against Kentucky at Kentucky. You know how that rivalry game gets with Kentucky versus Florida. It's going to be hard hitting. And Kentucky's only given up 77 yards of rushing per game. Like this, this game's already going to be chippy and close and just people going at it. And th- you got a good running defense. Um, I, I think this is a game. Th- this is also an, an upset alert game because I think Kentucky could very well upset Graham Hurts in the boys. But uh, yeah, I don't think Trevor ETM is going to have a good game. And honestly, it might o- it might be his only bad game of the year. Okay, mine is similar, and it's not a bad player. And it might be a little bit of a – I guess it's – I'm picking against him, so it's not a homer pick. But but I do think it's one of the best players in the nation right now, and that's Ashton Genty. He is – Very old. <laughs> basically he's the nation's best kept. He's the nation's best kept secret. Yeah. The best offensive kept secret. But I do think – and I mean, granted, you know – People are all over Memphis because they've given up a lot of rushing yards the past couple games. But one of those was on a short week to Navy, you know. I'm sorry, it's already hard enough to stop the triple option with a full week also, repair. Also, giving up 200, total, 200 rushing yards to Navy, it might might not be the worst thing if because they might only have 100 throwing yards. Right, and it was that game was on a Thursday. So basically, Memphis played on a Saturday. Then you have, you know... Sunday, you're not going to really practice because guys have to get treatment and all that kind of stuff. So you basically have Monday, Tuesday, and you're going to do a walkthrough on Wednesday. That's not a ton, of, a ton of time to prepare for a pretty like an offense that you have to, you know, be where you're supposed to be. So I do think in this game, you know, it's a basically. I mean. Boise State's probably already eliminated from that group of five conversation, but it's realistically 100% for both teams uh, eliminator from getting to that group of five game because, you know, if Memphis loses it, that's their second loss. They would have to go unbeaten, basically, for the rest of the year. Boise State loses it. In a weaker group of five conference. Yeah, Yeah, that's Boise State's third, so I just can't for the life of me see – three loss no nope. group of five i mean you look at teams like liberty like if liberty has one loss they're gonna go like i get the mm-hmm. cusa isn't great by any stretch of the imagination no they'll but... let in the they'll let in a one loss sunbelt team over a three loss right and i i just think that teams are gonna you know san diego state's defense hasn't it used to be good it has not been great the past couple years ever since mm-hmm. uh I cannot think of that uh, Rocky old Long coach's name. Rocky Long, since he left, now they have Brady Bubblegut Oak <laughs> as their head coach, and he's just not – he's not a good coach. I'll put it at that. So I do think that, you know, Memphis is going to look at that and be like, we can key in on him. And it won't even be – I don't even necessarily think he's going to have a bad game. I think he'll still, you know, do decent, but he's like – leading the nation in, like, all-purpose yards, and I just don't see him getting 227 yards or whatever it was he got last Mm -hmm. week again this week because teams are going to key in on him more and more and say, we'll leave our corners basically on an island because your receivers aren't really stepping up yet. Your quarterback's completing 50% of his passes. We'll make sure one guy is spying him and – will load the box. So I do think, you know, he, he'll still have a pretty decent game, probably pop off a couple of big runs, but I think that the expectations for him right now are to have 27 carries yeah. and 150 yards, stuff like that. So no, I totally agree. I, I, I think from like one perspective, like it won't be a bad game, but it's not going to be like the, Oh my goodness, this is like world shocking game. But right. you know, when you have that much production, sometimes defenses are going to key in on you and other people are going to have to step it up. Uh, my Buffalo pick, it's actually a little bit of a cop-out because it's a position group. It's the USC defensive line. 
because I think they're going to do a good job of stopping the run. And I think they'll do a pretty good job in the pass. But I think, how do I put this? I think there's going to be some plays where Shadir Sanders makes them look bad, like being able to scramble around, being able to do a ton of different stuff. And it's, it, I think we're going to have that question with USC defense. It's like, okay, are they good? Or are they not good? And the questions, just like last year, is going to keep continuing, continuing until they run into a wall and get their butt whooped like they did versus Utah. Yeah. So my, but and it was hard to find the Buffalo because I was like going back and forth on some teams, but I decided to go with the Texas A and M offensive line for this one. I think that I don't. I feel like they could come out and look really good. But I also feel like this is one of those games where they could new quarterback starting, and I just feel like Arkansas might just pin their ears back and make his Let life rip. a living hell. Yeah, like Sam Pittman. Yes, and it's like one of those. It's in Arkansas, and I think it's a Arkansas needs to win this one. You know, they've lost a couple in a row. They had some pretty decent expectations coming into this year, whether they deserve them or not. So we'll see. It was hard. Like there's like a, it was weird this week because there was a. I just don't know many people that I think aren't going to do that well. I guess. It's a weird. Like the matchups this week are kind of weird. There's not a ton weird. of. I you mean, know, like, you, we have the rank versus ranked, but I mean, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I, I got a dust storm in my friggin' room right now. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like I got. Oh my gosh, it's it's like I got a ton of Jeff Sims just throwing. I mean, if it was Jeff Sims throwing dust particles, they'd be in my eyes because he wouldn't be able to hit my nose. So, yeah, I'm 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 struggling right now, Zooch. With yeah, the dust. That's, that's how I feel. I've had kidney stones like last week and then got sick, so I'm finally feeling a little bit better now. I still get the occasional ache in my side, which I have to down a couple of Advil to make myself feel better. But sometimes you. Just have to power through. It's like getting your ankle taped. You have to be there when people need power you. Power through. Yeah, you do. It's a lot like college football. There's there's there's, there's some big players that their teams are going to need them this week. Ashton Genty's going to be needed. Audric Estime is going to be needed. Caleb Williams is going to be needed. A lot of these guys. Cam Ward going to be needed. These these guys are needed, and that's the great part of why we love college football. It's that. You have it, – it, it, it is so much more carried by singular players than the pro game. It is much more like basketball in that sense where one person in college can truly take over a game, in my opinion, if he's like a quarterback right. or someone who can, who can get the ball. But, yeah, it's my little positive monologue. You get, I mean, you got to be positive after all the technical <laughs> difficulties we had. So you do. glad I'm, – I'm glad we got through. It's going to be another great week. Um, yeah. Zeus, you got anything else to add at the end, baby? Nothing else. Um, oh. just going to look ahead and see what we have next week. Oh, well, next week we have Oklahoma, Texas. Oh, Maryland could be undefeated at Ohio state. LSU at Missouri. Um, oh, we're already getting ahead of ourselves. We're already getting ahead of ourselves. We're already getting ahead of ourselves. That, 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 that's that's going to be too much. We got, we, we got to focus on this week first, you know? Like like the road, you can't just be firing at all cylinders. Sometimes you're gonna need a weekend like this that's pretty good, but you can kind of put in the cruise control maybe like 50, 60 miles an hour. Just let it roll on the highway. The only impression I'll make is we know for a fact the big noon kickoff is the Red River shootout, and they'll show for the fiftieth year in a row somebody getting like a corn dog that's seventy feet long <laughs> at the Texas State Fair. Oh, and they'll 100% show the one year at the Red River shoot-off where, like, the Oklahoma, like, wagon, like, tipped over. <laughs> yeah. that, Guaranteed. If Oklahoma comes out and gets killed in that game, that will be on Twitter every other tweet, yep. and I will <laughs> yep. love that. Yep. I will Our friends immediately send that to Cody. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, we might have to get a word from Team Voicing. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah. Tune in next week. We're going to get a word from our resident Sooner fans. The Boomer Boys. Um, yeah, we'll get some words. But, yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening, guys. Yep. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the weekend of games.